Our next speaker is Dr. Sarah Kelly. Um, Sarah, I think, spoke last time at the last, at the last reunion. And um, so Sarah is an assistant professor of neurology and pediatrics at Hopkins. She did her pediatrics training at Hopkins. She did her neurology training at Hopkins. She did her pediatric epilepsy and neurophysiology fellowship at Hopkins. And we are absolutely thrilled to have her on board. She's um, standing behind me. Um, she's uh, really been a phenomenal, um, it's been really phenomenal watching her, you know, first as a resident, then coming up as a, as a fellow, and now as a partner. And, and I'd say she's um, actually best in her role as a colleague. Um, as great as she was before, she's even better now. So it's a real thrill to have her um, speaking to us today about um, seizures that happen. Again, this is a topic that the families wanted to hear about, what happens after the hemispherectomy. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, so we all hope when we uh, do surgery that we're going to end up having no seizures afterwards, but unfortunately it's not always the case. And so what I'm going to talk about is what happens when there are seizures afterwards, how common is it, and what do we do about it. So today I'm going to um, discuss a bit about outcomes after surgery, who who's has seizure freedom and who doesn't, um, when we think about taking off medicines, and does that lead to recurrence of seizures, um, what causes recurrence of seizures, and what do these seizures look like if they do happen again. And then I'm also going to touch on how we treat them. Uh, do we use medication? Do we go back for more surgery? What are the options? So first, seizure freedom. There's been a few studies recently looking at about 100, 150 patients uh, to see if they're seizure-free after hemispherectomy. And in those studies, about 55 to 60% of the patients they looked at who had hemispherectomy for all types of reasons were seizure-free. And of those, about 83% were no longer on medication and still seizure-free. And then of the 40 or so percent who, didn't, who weren't seizure-free, there was still a good number, about 13%, who had greater than 90% seizure reduction. Uh, so still a, a very good improvement. And then if you look at older studies that look at the same thing, these are all very similar results. So there don't seem to be any changes in seizure freedom recently. So who of the groups who have hemispherectomies are more likely to be seizure free? So those who have Rasmussen's encephalitis or perinatal strokes are more likely to be seizure free. Most likely because their injury or the issue that's causing the seizures is just on that one side of the brain. It hasn't gone to the other side. And so if you remove that side of the brain, um, then you're more likely to be seizure free. Those who are not as likely to be seizure free are those with developmental brain abnormalities. So these are people who had malformations that formed um, early on, uh, for example, in hemimegalencephaly. And many of these patients will have changes on both sides of the brain. So even if you remove one side that has most of the changes, you may have a great re reduction in seizures, but it's quite possible that seizures will occur on the other side. So if the patients are seizure-free, if the children are seizure-free, then we start to think about, should we take away medicine? When should we do this? Um, and um, is it worth trying? Is there a risk of recurrence of seizures? So the reasons to think about weaning medicines um, are many. The main ones are cognitive side effects. So we know that our seizure medicines um, are used to reduce the excitability of the brain to reduce seizures. And because of that, they can have many cognitive side effects. They can cause people to be sleepy, fatigued. Um, they can have trouble, uh, more trouble with learning, more trouble getting their words out, more trouble thinking. And taking away these medicines can often improve all of those things. Um, so seizure medication withdrawal can certainly improve overall cognition, and that's a big reason to think about taking away medicine if possible. There's also other long-term toxicity of medication. Um, so we know that some medicines can affect bone health long-term, um, and as well as liver and kidney function as well. So also something to think out think about. And many of our medicines interact with other medicines. Um, so they work on systems in the liver that also interact with other medications. And so if we can reduce that, um, that problem over time, that's very important as well. And also thinking about the ongoing cost. So there's the cost of buying medication, of course, but then there's also the cost of lab monitoring. Um, as time goes on, these certainly can add up. But why may we not want to wean? Um, so there's the concern that seizures are going to recur. Do we have seizures under control because we did the surgery and because medications are helping to prevent anything from breaking through? Um, and by taking away medicine, there's going to be increased anxiety. Are we not as protected as well from seizure recurrence? And then the other question that comes up is if you are seizure free, you take away medicine and seizures recur, what is the likelihood that you're going to be able to regain that seizure freedom? So there's been a couple studies um, of, of a large group of people looking at all sorts of patients who've had seizure surgery, not just hemispherectomies, but temporal lobectomies and other things as well. And the question is, does weaning medication affect the chances of remaining seizure free? 
And what those studies have shown, looking at groups of people both in 2009 and 2012, it shows that long-term seizure outcome is no different um, in those whose seizure, met seizure medication withdrawal is done early, so within six to 12 months, as opposed to those who are um, who's withdrawn later, such as within 12 to 24 months. <clears throat> But we do see that people who are going to recur, recur earlier. So the thought is that early seizure medication withdrawal maybe unmasks a surgical failure. So a patient who is going to have breakthrough seizures off medicine will have it regardless of whether or not you take away the medicine early or late. However, it doesn't increase the likelihood that you're going to recur. So how long should we wait? Uh, so there is a couple studies looking at this. Um, there is one um, specifically that looked at children and children after seizure surgery, and this is again all types of seizure surgery, not just hemispherectomy, although in all of these studies hemispherectomy was included. And in that study it showed that if you waited six months, that was about the time when you had the best success. So less than six, month, six months, maybe there's still some healing process that's going on, something that makes it more likely to recur, but if you six months or later in children, it seems to be a good time to start thinking about coming off medicine. And so why do seizures recur if they do recur after coming off medication? And these are the main causes, which I'll touch on each individually in a minute. Um, so residual epileptic tissue. There is something still in the brain that has the potential to cause seizures, and we haven't taken it out. Therefore, it can cause more seizures when you take away the medicine, which is preventing uh, those seizures from occurring. Incomplete disconnection. So we just heard about um, functional versus anatomic hemispherectomy. Um, and so if we don't, if we don't get all the connections, uh, they're connecting the, the epileptic side to the non-epileptic side, that can lead to more seizures as well. And then maybe there's um, an additional epileptic zone, which I just discussed, and could there be post-op complications, um, even uh, many months down the road, that could lead to increased seizures, such as bleeding or hydrocephalus. And one of the things that's been looked at um, is whether or not when a patient has seizures right after surgery, or what are called acute post-operative seizures, so within, within 30 days after surgery, are they more likely to go on to have seizures later? So we all feel in general that we don't want kids to have seizures right after surgery. We think maybe it can lead to a poorer outcome, and that's a general feeling among neurologists, but whether or not that's true is kind of uh, still up in the air. So in general, children who have hemispherectomies are less likely to have post-operative seizures. So for this group, it's not as likely to be an issue, but still can occur. And then there was one study that showed no change in outcome in children who um, had hemispherectomy and had uh, post-operative seizures, and then another that did show an increased risk later. So basically, we, we still don't know. We don't like to see them, but it may not make a, a big difference long term. Um, we do know that seizures the first day after surgery tend to not um, uh, lead to increased uh, seizures later on. And so does etiology matter? Does it, um, does it matter why we had the, or, uh, why the hemispherectomy was done? And um, there's different studies uh, that look at this, and the, qu the answer is it might. We don't, we don't know. So there are the issues that I talked about where there can be tissue on the other side um, that can be uh, increasing seizure, but the, the actual etiology itself doesn't seem to um, definitely predict whether or not um, recurrent seizures will occur. But all these studies have small sample size, and so that's an issue. Um, and then I'm going to talk about um, the predictors, which are the incomplete resection, the multifocal lesions, and EEG abnormalities. But before I talk about EEG abnormalities, oh, sorry, actually, I will go back to that in a second. So incomplete um, resection. So as we had discussed, um, incomplete disconnection. So you're more likely to see this in a functional uh, hemispherectomy. So um, with anatomic, you know you're removing much of the tissue, and so it's not likely that you're still going to have connections there um, that can lead to seizures. However, with functional hemispherectomy, it's sometimes difficult to know whether or not the, this can, it's completely disconnected, and because of that, there can still be connections that can lead to uh, future seizures. With anatomic hemispherectomy specifically, um, you, there can be uh, residual tissue. So it's not always possible to remove every bit of tissue that you'd like because of blood vessels and risk of bleeding and things like that. And so sometimes there can be something left over that can cause future seizures. Um, thinking about multifocal lesions, this is something we specifically see in um, uh, well, we can see, you can see it in multiple different uh, types of disorders, but developmental changes of the brain, like the hemimegalencephaly, can certainly be a type of, um, of disorder where you can see lesions on, multiple, um, on both sides of the brain, and that could be why you don't have seizure freedom. And then EEG abnormalities, um, if you get an EEG and you see that there is still seizure discharges, it likely indicates that one of the above two have happened, either there was an incom incomplete resection, um, or um, disconnection, or there's multifocal lesions. And 
specifically thinking about the EEG, uh, the question always comes up, what does the EEG look like after, um, after the seizure surgery? And what does it look like specifically on the operated side where either there was a disconnection or there was tissue removed? And so on the operated side where there was tissue removed, you see decreased activity um, because there's not the same amount of brain there as it was before. You can see slowing. But you can also see EEG seizures, specifically thinking about functional hemispherectomies where you're just disconnecting and you're not actually removing the tissue. The tissue that was there that was causing seizures is still there. And so um, you need to think about what that means if you see it. So if there are no clinical symptoms but you're seeing EEG activity, then it's not epilepsy because it's not causing seizures. It's not causing clinical symptoms. But if you see the EEG activity start on that operated side and spread to the other side, then you worry that there's not a complete, dis uh, not a complete disconnection and that that is indicative of um, ongoing epilepsy. And so this is an example of a patient who had an anatomical hemispherectomy. Um, you can see the right side was um, removed, and um, this is their EEG afterwards. So the way we look at EEGs is we do left, right, left, right. And you see the left activity is all normal. This is normal EEG activity. And the right is pretty flat. And you'd expect that because there is no um, brain tissue here, and so it's not going to show you much EEG activity. Sometimes you can see a little that comes through from the other side, but here you're not seeing very much. However, this is an example of an EEG where there was a functional disconnection, um, or a functional hemispherectomy. And again, it was on the right side, so you're looking at left, right, left, right. And this looks very similar to what we saw in the last EEG. This is normal on the left side. But on the right side, you see some activity that looks a little rhythmic right here. Um, and this is an EEG seizure. However, this patient did not have any symptoms from this, and it didn't spread to the left side. Therefore, we know that it's disconnected, and it's not causing any problems, and would not cause recurrent clinical seizures. <clears throat> So in general, um, we always think about etiology um, when we think about weaning seizure medicines. We tend to do it um, slower, just in general, as a group, in children who've had hemispherectomy, but whether or not we need to is the question. Um, and then weaning early um, seems to prevent long-term seizure medication consequences if they're not needed and does not increase long-term seizure recurrence. But if seizures recur, what do they look like? So there can be three main types of seizures that we see. The first could be exactly what we saw before the seizure. So we could see preoperative seizures, and this suggests that there's the seizure focus that we were trying to remove to begin with was not removed. There can also be a new seizure type, and this might be um, if there was a seizure focus that was not as, um, not as active before the surgery on the other side um, that was now causing seizures. The seizures may look different than what you had seen previously. And then there is a group of patients, um, both in kids who've had hemispherectomies and all patients who've had seizures, who um, have what are called non-epileptic events. Um, and these are paroxysmal events that look like seizures, um, often look different than the typical um, epileptic seizures that the patient has, but can look very similar, um, and occur in all types of, uh, a percentage of all patients who have seizures. So that's also something to look out for. And if recurrent seizures occur, uh, how do we treat them? So the main two categories we're going to think about are whether or not we reinstitute medications. We can restart the previous medications uh, that the patient was on. Often this is enough um, to control seizures. Um, but a lot of times uh, patients have been on medicines for years and years too, and we know our older medicines sometimes have more side effects than the newer medications. So thinking about a, a new medication that has a better side effect profile might be something you can do at that time also. And then can you regain seizure control if you recur if seizures recur after discontinuation of medicine. And so looking at a whole group of um, patients who've had seizure surgery, not, again, not just hemispherectomy, um, it shows that there's a very good chance of regaining seizure freedom. So up to 97% of patients will regain seizure freedom with restarting medication if seizures recur after withdrawal. And then the other thing we think about is whether or not we should go back for reoperation. <clears throat> So if the initial surgery was a disconnection or a functional hemispherectomy, then it may be possible to convert to an anatomic hemispherectomy and be sure that you not only remove all the tissue, but get all the, the connections that may have been missed the first time. Um, but sometimes difficult to know whether or not this is going to be effective just from uh, looking at the EEG and the MRI, but it's something we, um, we examine very carefully. Um, also, if it was an anatomic hemispherectomy initially, but we see that there was some tissue remaining, and perhaps it's um, safer now to remove that tissue than it was the first time, we can also go back and sometimes remove tissue, um, and that can lead to increased seizure freedom as well. 
And looking at studies of reoperation of children who've had MS hysterectomies, um, up to 50% of those patients were seizure free after reoperation. Um, and a very large proportion of them also were greater than 90% seizure free. So certainly can be quite helpful to go back for surgery after, um, uh, if the initial surgery uh, fails and there's recurrence of seizures. <clears throat> So in summary, um, over half of patients are seizure-free after their initial hemispherectomy. Weaning medication is certainly possible and is uh, recommended to prevent short and long-term side effects of medication if possible. And persistent or recurrent seizures um, can be due to incomplete disconnection and reoperation should be considered at that time. <clears throat>